Hey guys, welcome back to How to Produce Electronic Music in 2019 Without Tearing Your Hair Out. I'm Jordan, your new electronic music producer friend. Let's go hands-on a little bit. There's a really awesome resource I want to share with you over on Ableton.com. And even if you're not going to use Ableton as your DAW, this will really help you understand the components of beat making, rhythm, tempo, and just arranging song structure in general. You, the really cool thing about this resource is you don't have to install any software or download anything for it to work. It works right in your browser. I suggest using the Chrome browser if you have it. I haven't tested it on any other browsers. Probably works on them too. But if you have any glitches, use the Chrome browser. Okay, so I've pulled up Ableton.com and we're going to click the more arrow here, the plus sign. And we're going to go over to this section say, This says... We're going to go over to this section called Learning Music and click that. And that takes us to a website called learningmusic.ableton.com. So here, what you can do is you can click different tracks and they will all play and be synced up together through the website and it helps take you through some exercises so you can figure out how patterns work and how arrangement works because oftentimes arrangement is nothing more than just listening to different types of musical loops and figuring out which ones work best together. So rather than bore you with this section I'm going to scroll down to next make beats and you can play around with that other section right now if you feel like it. But this is the one I want to show you because this is what you're going to see in almost any sequencer and in almost any DAW, it's going to be very familiar. You're going to have a grid, there's going to be multiple drum samples that you've named probably, and they're going to be dragged into different channels or different sections. And all of these little squares here are MIDI data, M-I-D-I, as we talked about in our previous lessons. And instead of playing musical notes, they're going to play drum samples whenever those bars are triggered. So you can adjust the tempo here, change the BPM, and we can hear with this standard loop. Here, let's just create a dance loop. I'm going to hit clear. I'm going to show you a four on the floor standard dance loop. Four on the floor means we have a kick on every single downbeat. Oh, and by the way, one really cool thing about this resource is if you have a touch screen like a tablet or a laptop with a touch screen built into it, all of this can be done with your fingers too. It's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, four kicks and a clap on every other downbeat. And then as far as the hats go, uh, hats are usually like this on a standard drum beat with the open hats or the cymbals on every other beat. So it sounds like, and I'll go ahead and put it on 140 BPM just to be super authentic. So this is like the most standard drum loop you could ever create in dance music. Pretty simple, right? So you've probably heard this before in many songs. Here, let me turn it up a little bit in case you can hear it, because I am recording this with a camcorder, by the way, not any professional recording equipment. I'll uh, probably evolve as the class goes on, but for now, just listen to this quality. So, standard quick loop, you can change the tempo on that. So if we cut it in half from 140 to 70, that is half time. We've gone half time. And that allows us to put even more drum sounds into this same amount of space, uh, but not have it sound uh, like it's going too fast. See how much different that sounds just by changing the tempo and cutting it in half? So now we can do things uh, to kind of speed it up a little bit and make it feel more uh, more like a breakdown or more, more rhythmic. So 
So you just want to, you really want to play around with this and get hands on and get a feeling for what kind of rhythms you can come up with. It's not about sounding good right now. It's all about the rhythm because in the first step of making any drum loop, it's not about having these amazing drum samples. I mean, once in a while, you'll get lucky and you'll come out, you'll find a uh, sample pack that's just perfect and the samples all sound good already. Um, but even then you're going to be doing some editing to make them work with your song. So the first stage is not having perfect drum samples. By the way, this is going to be on the test. There is no such thing as a perfect sample. Okay, all samples need to be edited and even the worst samples, in your opinion, can be edited to work with your song. I guarantee it. Um, so it's all about rhythm in the first step of making a drum loop. And what you do is, even with crappy samples like these, no offense to anybody who's going to like use these in their polished production, you can make anything sound good, including these drums, and many famous songs have even used samples just like this and still become famous songs. Uh, but what I mean by crappy samples is you can probably come up with a sample pack that sounds a lot better than this uh, for your musical productions. So don't worry about what they sound like. Just create the rhythms, create the beats, experiment, see what different genres that you like can sound like in this grid and play around and see if you can find a song that you like and see if you can match up its drums with this right here on the screen and see if you can recreate just the drum pattern of one of your favorite songs, okay? That would be a very good thing for you to do right now if you want to memorize this and get this all in your in your memory okay so now that we've experimented with that and we've experimented with changing tempo and making different beats we've talked about half time double time you've got some ideas um, I, I would show you more rhythms but I'm gonna do that later when we build our first drum loop together so now we have a, another section that shows us the difference between two different drum loops so let's check it out we got they're both at 85 beats per minute And they both look almost identical. They are identical on paper. Let's hear the difference. Okay. Oh. So this is an example of how changing out your samples, you can have the same exact MIDI data on screen and you can change and swap out the samples to create completely new and different loops. So that's why I told you it's all about the rhythm at first. We don't really care if the samples sound good or not to begin with. We care about creating that rhythm and then we can swap samples in and out very quickly and easily to create the sound that we want after we've made the rhythm. This explains the differences between an electronic kick, and an acoustic kick, so you can hear that an acoustic kick has more tonal characteristics to it, and an electronic kick is kind of lacking in dynamics. It's, it's mainly just a pulse. It's generated in a computer. It's not recorded. It's not a real recorded sample, whereas an acoustic kick is one that has been recorded with an actual pedal on a, on a bass drum slamming into that drum to create that kick. So you can hear the actual pedal sometimes, you can hear the impact of the mallet on the drum itself, and then you can hear the drum reverberate a little bit. All of that happens with a real drum kick. But with an electronic kick, all that is simulated in analog. So an, an electronic kick is often boosted in its tonal characteristics by mixing it with an acoustic kick. It depends on what genre you're working with, of course, whether you want to do that. But oftentimes, acoustic kicks might not have enough bass to them, and you can add more bass to them by blending them with an electronic kick. And that's done with equalizing and using ADSR and things like that. And we'll get into that when we talk about layering. Now they're talking about claps, snares. So you can hear the difference between a, uh, a clap that's generated by a computer and an acoustic snare. So go ahead and play around with all of that. Get a feel for the different sounds here. And 
and that's just done with a <laughs> with a mouse. It's a lot more fun when you're you're doing it on a tablet or something like that. If you have a tablet, I suggest playing around with that. That'll really get you into the spirit of beat making and groove making because you know you want it to be fun. You don't want it to be all fun, all right? Because if you want to make really good music, some of it is a little tedious. I got to be honest with you. Some of it is you listening to the same thing over and over and over until you you just can't even listen to it anymore, uh, and you're just fine tuning little bits of it to make it sound perfect. Um, but at, at in the spirit of it, you you want it to be probably sixty percent fun, you know, forty percent tedium. <laughs> So you want to have fun doing it because people who listen to your music are going to know whether or not you had fun making that track because it's going to come out in the expressiveness of the track. So it's important that you are playing to some degree. And this goes back to the topic of workflow. One thing that uh, music classes are not properly teaching these days is that every single lesson that you're going through in, in this it, learning music theory, scales, rhythm, sequencing, hardware, everything. You should always be thinking to yourself, but what is my workflow? How do I like to produce music? What is fun for me? And for many of you, you're not going to know yet. So you need to try everything. You need to get your hands on hardware uh, drum machines and see if you like the way they sound. See if you like that feeling, that tactile feeling of adjusting those sliders and things with your hands. Or do you just prefer getting nitty and gritty with a mouse and manually arranging them on the screen? Which is, a, by the way, the first method we're going to learn because anybody can do it and it gives you the most control over your drum loops. Um, but yeah, just keep that in mind all the time what is my workflow? What is fun for me? And, and it has to be fun, but it has to be like 60% fun. Do not sacrifice quality for fun unless you're just going to be doing this as a hobby. If you want to take this to a professional level and start building a name for yourself, maybe 60% fun, right? So <laughs> not to be a downer or anything. And, and, and you know, it, it, and, and sometimes tedium is fun, you know, I mean, it's all it's all music. Sometimes you get sick of it and you, you drop it and you come back to it later and you're having fun again. So just keep that in mind. So they're talking about what is a beat, what is tempo, things like that. And here is a, another section where you can build your own drum loop. And uh, they're, they're talking about, hey, you should add a beat at 1, 5, 9, and 13. And that's the standard four on the floor that I already showed you. Oh, look, wow. They even unlock a little uh, text box here when you do it. And they even tell you it's four on the floor. See, I know my stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do you guys wrong. I'm already teaching you what everybody else is going to be teaching you. <laughs> so we'll go to next, tempo and genre. And feel free to pause the video and do what Ableton uh, is suggesting on the screen, because this is really great for basics. Um, here's some examples of different tempos of different genres. And another example of a beat. Let's talk about backbeats. That's that's a backbeat. So we already talked about that. Okay, here's the concept of what a bar is. You heard people saying they'd be spitting bars. Kids, if you want to piss off your parents. Let's talk about what a bar actually is. So this particular drum pattern that we're looking at here is two bars long. And what a bar is, is it's four downbeats. That's it, it's boom, 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 boom. That's one bar. And after that repeats, it's a second bar. And that, that's regardless of the tempo. So if your tempo is like boom, 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 that's still one bar, right? So you can fit more bars into a shorter amount of time by increasing the tempo. But let's not get too mathematic about it. Um, so this particular loop is at 90 beats per minute. And it's two bars long. And as you, you'll be able to hear the kick hitting on the downbeat. And so you can hear when one bar ends and the next begins. One bar. Second bar. So that's two bars, and now it's talking about different genres, which is pretty cool. Basic rock beat. So 
So just play around with all of those different beats. This is uh, what house music often looks like. This is what rock music often looks like. And when I when I placed that um, when I placed the drums in uh, this pattern here. And that's like a drum and bass groove, essentially. You always have that bonka, bonka, bonka as the, the backing. Now it's going to talk about a particular song and modeling the drums based off of that song and another song. So you can kind of go through and hear how these different songs are being, uh, how their grooves are made. And uh, this is the best section here because you get to play around and build whatever you want and record it. And it even lets you export it to live, which is pretty, pretty neat. So you can export the groove that you've made to live and then change out the samples to different ones if you want. See, this website's pretty cool, huh? It teaches you a lot of things and, and lets you go hands on. We already covered a lot of this, like the concept of pitch and things like that, the different notes. Like those are four different or five different musical notes. Um, and now it's talking about making patterns with pitch because this is what you're gonna be doing in the piano roll, as you've already seen. You're going to be drawing a lot of notes into this grid and you've already done this in some of the prior lessons, but if you want a refresher, this is a great way of doing it. They give you five notes to play with that are all in the key of C major and you can just kind of experiment so there's a little arpeggio kind of loop so experiment see what kind of cool combos you can come up with start using chords so anyway Keys and scales, you already know all about that, but if you want a refresher, you can do it there. Got minor scales, adding notes, playing with the notes and the scales. Okay, this is another good section for you. If you want to recap on your knowledge of melody, this is pretty cool because you can literally just click the different types of scales. Now, all we've covered so far in the class is major and minor. To let you know what Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, and all of these other ones mean, they're essentially taking the the scale, and, and, and I'm just gonna tell you real quick because it's really not that important. But Dorian, Phrygian, and all of that, it's it's taking a scale, right, and it's shifting it one note up. So instead of starting on C for C major, you would start on D. And th that gives you a, a different scale, so it goes from D to D now in the scale of C major, though. If that makes sense. Play around with these different scales because this is automatically going to adapt the grid. Boom, there's your minor scale compared to a major scale. Darn, I should have told you guys about this in the first course, huh? But I just discovered this resource myself, and I wanted to share it with you. This would have been helpful when you were first learning Melody, um, but you can always do a refresher, and I'll put it on the website for new students as well. Now, the real cool thing about this particular page that we're on here is it these two sections sync up with one another. So if you want to go ahead and create your first actual uh, melodic beat, so see what kind of cool little melodies and beats you can come up with in this browser. And uh, we'll keep continuing through. So this teaches you about chords. We're talking about the triads. Major and minor triads. See how it's always the first, the third, and the fifth though. Remember I told you those patterns. Now if you want to learn it a different way, because uh, it's always best to, to learn something in multiple ways. You know, the Jordan Winslow way isn't always the best way. You know, it's just a way. It's a tool to add to your repertoire. But if you want to learn it the Ableton official way, then 
perfect. Now you know two methods. So here's another song that they're helping you model with uh, the chords here. Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> nice. They're talking about harmony here. I'm getting harmonic with Mary Had a Little Lamb. That's where we're getting complicated. That's This is the kind of stuff I'm going to begin covering in advanced melody where we're starting to do a lot more chords. Um, we, we covered the, the basics of it, uh, but when you start doing melodies like this, it becomes a lot more complicated. And oftentimes you'll be... Uh, splitting these up. Normally you wouldn't necessarily play these high notes here uh, on the same instrument that you're playing these low chords. For instance, you might have these chords be playing on some cool little synth and then only play the piano notes as the high notes. So there's a bunch of different ways of looking at it. I'm not going to be covering more about chords here. You can always go through this at your own leisure. I think we've pretty much covered everything about beats. Uh, and then it does go into bass lines, which we are going to be covering. Uh, in my next lesson, I'm going to be blending some uh, bass with some drum loops. And we are going to create our first hip hop groove completely from scratch with free plugins. That's going to be in the next lesson. This is like an introductory lesson to that. So if you'd rather just go to that, you can, or you can do this first, which would be a good refresher. And I would go through here and just do all these different uh, creative lessons because they're very simplistic and hands-on. And if you have any questions about any of these, just ask me in the classroom forum and I'll help you as soon as I can or another fellow student will answer your question for you because we're building a little community. So I hope that this is a really awesome resource for you guys and that this really helps you. Um, now I'm just going to show you a couple little things before I end this lesson. I'm just going to show you um, different types of technology. I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to type in uh, drum machine and I'm going to go to videos and let's see well actually i'm not going to do videos you guys should look through the videos of course but here's what drum machines look like these are physical most of them are analog and that means that they create their sound from scratch with electrical impulses and they're very pure and warm and high quality like i talked about earlier um, but you've got your little pads down here, which you hit them with your fingers to trigger the drums. And each one of these channels here corresponds to a drum, each one of these little lines. And so you, you've had like your kick, your, your clav, your toms, snaps, claps, all that, snares. And um, you create your little drum loops with the, this physical hardware. This is one of the more accessible ones. This is called the Korg Volca Beats. They have a few other ones. The Korg Volca Drums might be a little bit uh, better for some examples. And what this one does is it's very, very similar to the other one you were looking at, but just a scaled down, less expensive version where you've got your kick, your snare, your tom, and your hat. And you've got three knobs for each where you can adjust the different tonalities of them. But the difference between this physical hardware, for one, you got your hands on it. It's right in front of you. You're twisting these knobs. It's tactile. It's a totally different workflow. So maybe that works for you. Maybe you love that. Or maybe it just like it takes your focus away. And you're like, eh, I kind of want to be focused on the DAW. And I want to do everything in the DAW. So maybe you want a MIDI controller instead of these hardware samplers, right? Or not hardware samplers, these hardware drum machines. So let, let's take a look at a MIDI controller instead. In fact, let's look at a specific one, which of course it pops up first because it's so popular, uh, but the Native Instruments machine. Let me see if I can scroll down. These are all examples of MIDI controllers. Most of them look like keyboards. And what MIDI controllers do, I've already told you in a previous lesson, but in case you forgot, MIDI controllers control the DAW. They don't do anything of their own. They can control external hardware, they can control your DAW, but they can't generate sounds on their own. At least the lion's share of them. 
otherwise they'd be considered synthesizers or drum machines. So let's go ahead and pull up Native Instruments Machine. Now, believe it or not, look at this thing. You'd look at it and you'd think, wow, this is probably um, probably a drum machine, right? You probably make all your drums right on here, and in, to some degree you do. But really, this is just an advanced MIDI controller. It, it has software that you install on your computer, and uh, all this stuff runs inside your DAW. And all this hardware does is when you press one of these pads, it triggers a sample that's loaded in your DAW. So these are actually way different than a hardware uh, drum machine because even though they might take your focus off the DAW a little bit, the sound isn't generated there. The sound is generated in the DAW. So MIDI controllers may help you if you're not interested in the, the hardware approach where you're kind of generating sounds with, with analog and you'd rather just use samples to begin with. Well, something like Native Instruments Machine is probably better for you. This isn't a buying guide. This is to give you an idea of different hardware that's out there. Do not buy any of this stuff at this stage in your uh, music production career, unless you're just rich, in which case you should just send me that money instead, okay? Um, so this is an example of some MIDI controllers. Uh, I've showed you hardware, drum, uh, machines. Now let's look at samplers. Samplers look a lot like drum machines, except these guys can load samples directly onto the hardware. Not all of them, some of them, like this Korg Electribe. You can load samples onto the actual device itself, and then when you press the, the buttons on it, it plays it regardless of having a DAW. So they, they do everything on their own, and they're a totally different type of workflow. So some people use those, some people like using Native Instruments Machine. I'm kind of more on the digital spectrum, but the way that I look at it is digital can only get you so far before you're going to need a little bit of analog, right? Because if, if you want just insane piercing bass lines and really if you want to fill out your mix with original and powerful sounds, you're probably going to want to supplement your sound with analog equipment. So I'm in the process of, of getting some new analog equipment myself for that purpose. And when I get it, I'll be reviewing it and showing you guys how to use it. And you can determine if it's good for your workflow or not. Or maybe you're like, hey, Jordan, screw all that digital stuff. I want to make everything hands-on, no DAW, no computer. Well, you can do that with samplers, with drum machines, and with synthesizers and modulars. Let's give you a, your first introduction to a modular. They look crazy. Modular synthesizers are the most complex form of sound synthesis. And you can probably tell just by looking at them, they got cables running all over the place. Um, I like semi-modulars the best because a semi-modular gives you a bunch of knobs to tweak in addition to little holes where you can plug in these patch cables as they're called and you can route the sound from one thing to another and the sound is traveling around this wire, getting affected by different effects and stuff, all right there on your table. You know, and it requires no DAW to make all of this sound. It's completely done from scratch. And in fact, um, many of these devices can be used for live performances. A lot of people do performances that way. Um, but I have to tell you, all that music does sound a lot more experimental. It takes serious dedication to make really high quality, polished professional productions that don't just come off as experimental when you're using equipment like modular synthesizers. So it takes it's a certain breed of person who uses that or maybe they use it as a supplement. For example, uh, Dead Mouse, very famous uh, electronic dance producer, loves modulars, but even he, he doesn't make his whole sound, he doesn't make the whole song with nothing but a modular. He creates some of the tones in his music with the modular and then uses the DAW to arrange everything. So at the end of the day, you're probably still going to use your DAW for all of the arrangement and all of the mixing and mastering and just polishing the song, but you could make your workflow all on your table, all tactile, right there in front of you, tweaking knobs, pressing buttons. It's just up to you. And you can do that with either the hardware analog route that I've just showed you with the hardware drum machines, modular synthesizers, and normal synthesizers, which just look like keyboards like this one here on Sweetwater, 
Okay, I'm not going to bother loading that. You can see it, that little piano. Um, or MIDI controllers. And MIDI controllers are much, much less expensive because they rely on your computer to do all the work. Um, but just an example, one of the pieces of hardware that I use every day right now, and again, this isn't a buying recommendation. I will make a buying guide eventually when I feel like you guys are ready for it. But for now, let me just show you kind of one of the things that I use every single day on my table that's hardware. And this is a MIDI controller, technically. It's a very fancy and expensive <laughs> MIDI controller. And you can see it has tons of different pads. These can be used to play melodies or drum samples. So I can load a drum sample into each one of these and then play beats, or I can play melodies, I can play chords, you know? But it's beyond that. You know, we have our record functionality, play, record. Uh, we've got the screen where we can go and we can turn these knobs and start editing synthesizers and stuff that are built into Ableton on this actual screen. And the only time that breaks down is when you start using third party um, synthesizers. So it really is heavily based off Ableton. They want you to use Ableton everything if you're going to be using the, the push. And that's what this is called, the Push 2 hardware controller. Uh, and I use that practically every day. I used to use my piano a lot more. Um, but, you know, for my personal workflow, especially someone who works in genres like hip hop often, and I just love drums, uh, having a little sequencer like this with this kind of unorthodox shape is interesting for building chords, for building melodies, and for sequencing drums. And uh, nobody wants to sequence drums on a piano. You can do it, it just doesn't feel right. Pads feel more realistic for that. Um, so there's the different hardware and the different software that is used. Just a quick, another quick example, battery. I'm not suggesting you get this software or anything. This is just an example of what's called a sampler. This is a digital sampler that runs inside your DAW and it does what those hardware samplers do. You load individual samples in it, you edit each sample by turning little digital knobs, and you can control those knobs with your MIDI controller, by the way. And uh, so you could be turning a physical knob on your table, like I just showed you, and be adjusting these digital knobs. Maybe that's your style. I don't know. Maybe you like doing everything with the mouse. That's that's how I first started, that's for sure. And so you, you can sample everything in there. Um, and I'll give you more recommendations as we go along. For now, you just need to be familiar with it. And we're going to be using Ableton's built-in sampler. Um, or you can... I think there might be a free sampler plugin that you can download from the free tools section of the classroom website. If not, I'll add one eventually. Um, but all DAWs pretty much have some sort of sampler or drum rack in there. Uh, it's called one name or another, but just has those little pads and you drop samples into them. And then with your MIDI notes, with your piano roll, you say, I want this clap to happen here. I want this kick to happen here, or even some crazy sounds like birds chirping and explosions and stuff. You can have them be on that piano roll too. And so that helps you with beat creation a lot. So does tangible physical hardware. Start thinking about what feels right for you. And if you're really interested, uh, go on down to your local shop. Please don't buy anything yet. Like I said, at this stage in your music production career, probably shouldn't be buying equipment yet. But go down to the local shop, uh, music shop, and start messing around with some of that physical equipment. Ask them, hey, do you guys have any uh, analog drum machines that I can just play with and hear? I just kind of want to see what it sounds like, you know, see if it's for me. Um, and just play around with it, right? And get some experience. So I think I've covered all of the basics on the different ways that you can make the drum loops. I know you probably wanted to dive in a little bit more and start making your first loop outside of that browser window that I just showed you. But uh, I promise you, you're gonna have a blast in the next lesson because I'm gonna teach you start to finish how to create a pretty cool hip hop beat completely from scratch with individual samples, not even a loop or anything. We're gonna do it, we're gonna arrange every single sample manually 
and we're gonna create a killer baseline to go with it and um, I'm gonna show you how to do it for free without spending a dime on any of these fancy plugins any fancy hardware nothing completely for free with tools that are right on that link so you might want to go there and start downloading some free software because uh, in the next lesson you're gonna be using it all right so I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks so much for learning with me. Again, if you have any comments, questions, do it in the classroom forum. And uh, if you're on YouTube, please like and share and subscribe because I really gotta grow this channel. I only got like 74 followers right now. It's pretty crazy uh, for the, the level of production and how much is going into this. I think you guys know a, there's probably a lot of people out there who would benefit from this. So please share it. It's a free resource. Um, and thanks so much for, for listening and uh, just give me any feedback you can because I want to grow as a teacher as well and I want to help you guys the best that I can. So I'll talk to you later guys.